Okay. Hello. <laughs> Karen Rand here. I decided to do a segment on this Compassionate Capitalist show specific to the reasons why and the benefits why and the myths about angel investing and why those myths exist. If you have been listening to this podcast regularly, you are likely one of the apparently minority of people out there that know and embrace the idea of investing in entrepreneurs as an asset class. Uh, it is kind of the whole premise behind what I do within the Compassionate Capitalist Movement and the Compassionate Capitalist Show and, you know, my book and everything like that. But if you're new to this, because I am gaining a lot of new listeners these days, or you're one of those business owners out there, or those executives that just like these business type topics and never really thought of yourself as being somebody that could be an angel investor. If that's never really been something that you were like, you know, oh, that's something that other people do. Well, this is the show for you. Okay. And, and, I, and I really hope that you uh, get great value of it. Listen to it all the way through. Give me a comment, share it because we are getting this movement for compassionate capitalists uh, go wing. All right. So let's start with this. So I, you know, uh, chat GPT, all the rage, right? You know, the reality is that it doesn't invent anything. It isn't smart. It's just the best crawler for a search engine. It basically knows it, it goes out there to the world of internet stuff and pulls the information, right? So it's always nice to see if like what I think does chat GPT agree? <laughs> so I asked it, what is an angel investor? And this is the, the, the what it came back with. Angel investing refers to the practice of investing money in startup companies or early stage businesses, typically in exchange for ownership equity or convertible debt. Angel investors are typically individuals who have accumulated wealth through successful careers and are looking for high risk, high return, high reward high return investment opportunities. Well, you know, the irony of that is that um, they obviously have not got on to the, the um, bandwagon of crowdfunding investing and how the entire marketplace has changed. And that could be because very much like what, you know, the reason why most people still don't know about angel investing is that it was illegal for 90 years. I want to talk about that more in just a second, but so the Jobs Act passed in 2012. That was when they removed 90 years of laws, making it illegal for non-millionaires to invest in startup and early stage companies. It was even illegal for the companies to solicit investment from non-millionaires. Since 2012, the opportunity for anyone with disposable income to invest in private businesses has been available. So about 10 years. Now, it took a few years for it all to roll out, but the whole idea of it, it's like, and I'll talk more about that in a, in a bit, but I want to let that settle in. On one hand, you have 90 years of secrecy behind closed doors, right? Heck, <laughs> when I was managing, you know, the angel group where I learned all the stuff that I know and I talk about now and I wrote the book on, I'm going to show that you see it right behind me, right? For those that are watching on YouTube, on my YouTube podcast channel. Uh, when I was running that angel investor group and we would hold our dinners and pitch events, we had a requirement of the venue to be able to close the doors. I remember this one place here in Atlanta, Buckhead Club, um, when we were expanding and we needed a bigger space, their bigger space was in this loft and it had no doors. And we couldn't have our meeting there. We could eat and mix and mingle there, but we had to go into another room and close the door. So just on an off chance that somebody walking by would hear the companies presenting to this group of angels and asking for money because that was illegal. We did not want that company founder to go to jail for violating security laws. I mean, it, it, it really was that way, right? And so 
uh, it's just amazing to me, right? But because what were they doing? If you if you've been to my website and you watched me heard me tell the story of the secret society, that's really what it was. We were a part of a a secret society, a community that would meet to determine which entrepreneurs were worthy of getting money so that 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 founder could go on and succeed and build a company that we believe would be successful and we would make money in that process right that's really kind of the 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 premise behind all that to get a return on that investment and so if you've listened to any of my shows in the last five weeks you would know that i have also launched the Compassionate Capitalist Wealth Maximizing System. It's a live hands-on training digital course, totally interactive that maps to the book I wrote to serve as a primer to provide the pathway, right? The Inside Secrets to Angel Investing, the lighted pathway for millions of Americans, maybe even those in faraway lands, to learn how to be an angel investor. Of course, that book, Inside Secrets into Angel Investing, was the first step and putting the information out there, then the rebirth of this podcast, and then now the launch of the course. And with that, there'll be there 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 are DIY. You can do it at your own pace. Log in at midnight on Saturday on Friday night when you can't sleep, or Monday morning, whatever, and you know be able to do your own look at your own thing. And also, the intro courses are done on a monthly basis. Uh, and currently that could change based on market demand. I consider myself sort of in a, a beta test mode where we're putting a lot of this out there, seeing what works best for the the market of of really the 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 people that are most hungry for this right now are the folks between 25 and 45 that are in a growth stage in their careers and are wanting to see about how to accumulate wealth. Uh, particularly the 25 to 35 year olds, they are not afraid of crowdfunding, not afraid of reward based crowdfunding. Uh, so they're they're hungry for this information. So I'm putting it all together to get out there. And then I have a, a whole sort of it that's for those people that maybe did one or two. They've done a couple of angel investments in the past and just really never felt comfortable that they really had mastered it well. Maybe they made an investment and lost their money. And they'd like to do more, but they want to do it wisely. And there's, quite frankly, no training out there for it. Now, there's hit and miss, this, that, and the other thing that people do. And there's things that happen within its structured angel groups, but there's really no structured training for this like there is for real estate investing, for example, or stock market investing. So I'm solving that problem. <laughs> if you want to invest in me, no, I'm joking. All right, so... So do you, if you want to invest in small businesses and startups, I know it sounds intimidating. I get it. Now that I'm out there really pushing this whole education system, I get it. I get the, the comments from people all the time. But it's actually a smart and profitable way to build wealth. Investing in entrepreneurs is an asset class that's just as valid and profitable as the real estate or the stock market. Scout's honor. In fact, owning a piece of multiple small businesses can be three times more profitable than investing in other assets. Three times more profitable. Google it. Go ask chat GPT and they'll tell you the same thing. I found and I found that even successful business owners, those that listen to my show, create thriving, profitable business, but never think about investing in other entrepreneurs. I, I, I discovered this when I would be networking at the chamber and stuff. And these people that own million dollar businesses and they invest in real estate in the stocks and never think about investing in entrepreneurs as something for them themselves to do. It's always something that this mythical, super wealthy, got mo money to burn type of person becomes an angel investor. And that's just not the case. The people that are angel investors, are active angel investors, are thoughtful about the process. They're very conservative with their money. Uh, and they do it, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, for a whole other reasons Yes, make money, but the compassion side of the cap capitalist side, the compassion side, capitalists is making money. The compassion side is choosing to make money in a way that 
has greater impact and fills a passion that you yourself have. And that's what I teach, all right? You know, I was naive to think that my book was enough. When I first came out with this book, after the Jobs Act got passed, and I said my biggest fear had been that people would that would run out there and start crowdfunding investing and they'd lose their money and then it, it this you know a, investing in entrepreneurs would have uh would have a, even a blacker eye right than than what has been created by the myths because if you think about it for those 90 some odd years from 1933 to when the Securities and Exchange Acts were passed to 2012 when the Jobs Act was passed, people needed to make money. You know, people, money makes money. And so all the wealth managers and financial planners that couldn't talk about angel investing, what they talk about? They talked about stock market and people created education systems for the stock market. And then when the laws changed or the rules or whatever the things changed in the 80s for real estate prior to the 1980s, the only people that had invested in real estate were super, super wealthy people and institutions. But then it, they changed on, uh, you couldn't get a loan for investment properties for a long time. And they changed tax laws to allow people that invest in real estate to write off business expenses. And when those changed, then you created the whole cottage industry of of how to invest in real estate started to happen. So that I, that's where I am. That's what I'm doing right now. I am where that real estate education investment market was 30 years ago. We're starting that right now. And you're listening to this because... I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you the details, the information that you need to make a decision on whether this is something you want to invest time in learning before you even make your first dollar investment, right? Because I, I wrote this book. It's got a step-by-step -step guide. Every end of each chapter says, you know, what to do next. And it has a resource portal with the tools that, you know, uh, any investor would need to make decisions about investing in entrepreneurs. But I didn't ever do anything more than that. I didn't know how to. I didn't know. I finally found the right person to help me put this together and, and put this out to the benefit of the marketplace. Because you think about it, 150 million people invest in the stock market. 7 million people in the United States invest in the real estate. In both cases, that's people that are making just $75,000 a year or more. That's not a millionaire. That's a middle class person, okay, that is putting money into these other asset class thinking they are the best way to create wealth and the least risky because they don't know about angel investing and what they hear about angel investing word on the street, word of mouth, is that it is risky. It is like gambling. Oh, it doesn't have uh, tangible assets associated with it. Oh, you can't get your money back. Oh, 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 all this stuff. And I and if we have time, I'll, I'll go into those kind of things as well. But I talk about that in the intro class very much so, right? So in, that is the sweet spot of the opportunity that the government was trying to provide to investors like you and me. I'm not a millionaire, <laughs> but I'm a millionaire adjacent, right? You know, um, they wanted to give us the opportunity to invest like millionaires, the way the mega rich millionaires have been investing for a hundred years. That was the secret Again, from 1933 to 2012. And the reason why was because those titans of industry, the Rockefellers, the DuPonts, the Hiltons, the Shell, the all of the different things that you hear, that you know about, the people that were creating and building America back in the Industrial Revolution, Right. Back in those days, they when they passed the security laws, it said you have to disclose, right? You have to be the the public market stuff because of the great the great 
depression, the stock market crash, those folks knocked on the SEC doors and said, hey, we want you to carve out exceptions for private transactions because we want to be able to continue to invest in each other's businesses without having to tell the government about it. And they said, all right, we'll do that for you. And so that's what they established the rules that said no general solicitation. That's why we had to close the doors because if the doors were open and the public could hear, then that was a public solicitation. When they pitch at these big venture conferences, they should not be saying, and now they can in some ways, but they shouldn't have been saying, I used to have the rule at my big pitch events where there was, I didn't know everybody in the audience was not necessarily an investor. They could not say from the stage, they were raising capital and how much they were raising. It was clear and obvious that people were raising capital. That's why they were there. But then they would go and have private meetings to have those conversations. So we stayed within the laws of the SEC on how to solicit. You had to have a relationship with the person. The angel group, me, became the anybody that with the screening process. That was the relationship. But that was really the rules of the of the get the day. And and so in the vacuum. What did people do? Oh, invest in gold, invest in stocks, invest in real estate, invest in bonds. Right now, just on an aside, in the crowdfunding space, there's a company up in Baltimore that is just fascinating. They issue bonds on behalf of a company to the community. The community buys the bonds. They have a guaranteed return uh, you know, back on them. It's, you know, low. It's like, like a way a bond would be. Um, in investing in local businesses in that community, they are having an impact in that community and they're doing it through bonds. I thought that was brilliant, right? There's so many ways that you can invest in entrepreneurs. You can be a bank. You can loan them a little bit of money, bridge them, you know, help uh, when they're getting ready to do a big order, the retail order to Walmart or something, and they got to go to manufacturing they're, you, they want to bring manufacturing into their a $10 million company, a guy you know that or a gal you know from the chamber, and they want to bring manufacturing into the United States from offshore. They can go get an SBA loan for this amount, but they need this other amount to hire up people, you know, do their marketing for this new product they're launching. You could be an investor in that, and it could be structured. I'm going to, I'm working with a company right now on this in a, what they call revenue financing. So you get paid back a percentage of those rev that revenue on a monthly, quarterly, or however it gets structured basis until three times your money is paid back. And you know that that company has the contracts. You know that that company has the ability to make money. So where's the risk in that? Yeah, there's some risk, but not as much as there is in the stock market that you have no control over and oftentimes in the real estate market. And then we're going to talk more about that here as I proceed on, right? But I, I get excited about this. I actually have a whole thing. It's taken me days to write the the show notes for what I want to tell with you today, back and forth, editing it and stuff like that. And I've already digressed three times off of it. But anyway, so they wanted to give millions of Americans the opportunity to invest in the potential of entrepreneurs and their growing business. And I'm going to tell you exactly why in just a few minutes. The crazy thing to me is what little actual understanding and even basic awareness of the possibility there is out there about the value and benefit of angel investing, even if you're only able to invest in crowdfunding companies. I mean, literally, and I'm going to give you two stories, okay? I'm going to tell you two brief stories about conversations I've had within the last couple of weeks that drives this point home. So the goal of the compassionate capitalist wealth maximizing system is to shepherd new investors to the concept of investing in entrepreneurs and those that have some experience at angel and crowdfunding investor to get better to be more confident through this, these steps to become comfortable and confident with investing in entrepreneurs as comfortable as they are in investing in the stock market and real estate, right? It should not be elusive, a myth or anything. And by the way, if you want to sign up for an upcoming intro class, 
or just get in the queue to start learning more about the actual interactive training of the Compassionate Capital Wealth Maximizing System, then go to do the deal.org. Do the deal.org. It's also in the show notes, but do the deal.org. All right. I said it three times and I will say it again before the end of this. So let me tell you this first story. And I'll tell you the reasons why angel investing is still a secret and what the myths that discourage it are and why they exist and the reality of the benefits of learning how to invest wisely in entrepreneurs. And you may relate to these stories. So first is a friend. She's retired with a good pension, uh, considering investing in real estate, open to the opportunity I described. She'd been watching some of the stuff I've been putting out on Facebook. And she asked me, there's my friend Jane. She asked me when she ran into me at this meeting, she said, why is it that I'm always talking about investing in entrepreneurs? And she wondered, how is it better than investing in the stock market and real estate? Oh, my favorite question. I explained to her that investing in entrepreneurs is my passion because I love the idea that somebody sees a problem, figures out a solution to that problem just from the imagination they have and whatever knowledge they have or ability to go and find people that have knowledge and they create a solution that solves a problem that changes our world, makes it better. That, that just the idea, that basic idea get, makes me excited. I'm just excited about that. And so, hell, and I've seen so many ideas, so many done deals, things that are, that would, would solve fundamental problems, save lives that never get to where they need to get to make an impact because they didn't get the funding because there's not enough investors out there. I gave you those numbers, the 7 million real estate investors. You know how many investors there are in entrepreneurs right now? We're talking 90 years. So 90 years that it's been a secret, even with all the the rise of the dot-coms from the, the 80s into the 90s, you know, Okay, into the 2000s when the, that crashed. So even all of that, card carrying in an angel group, about 350,000 angel investors in the United States. There's about 7 million, 5 to 7 million accredited investors, those people that technically could be the official angel investor in the United States. But there's only about 350,000 that invest in uh, in entrepreneurs through angel groups. So there's some number that's not tracked that way. And then there's some people that invest in the reggae plus and these other kinds of offerings. But in crowdfunding in reg CF, okay, which is probably the biggest group of crowdfunding investors in reg CF, reg crowdfunding, uh, 350,000 in 2022. Those are going to be people that are making that $75,000 or, or more, right? That aren't, you know, making $400,000. So somewhere in that gap between $75,000 and $300,000, you know, perfect place for crowdfunding investors, $350,000. It's been 10 years. Or Okay, so Reg CF was uh, 2015, all right? Even that, seven or eight years. And there's still only $350,000 in that. And, you know, that's just a, it's a, like amazing to me. And I'm going to talk about something because you're going to, I know you you're got a question coming in there and I'm going to guess your question here, but, you know, and, and so I told her that it's my pot, my passion because of this, right. And that I do the, take the time to produce this podcast every week to really help entrepreneurs and investors learn about the best practices for creating wealth by building successful entrepreneur endeavors and being an investor in those ideals without all the risks because, you know, launching and growing a successful business takes a lot of time and money. It's risky when you are the one putting in all the time and money. And I shared with her the, some important reasons why investing in entrepreneurs is a great idea and what it means for anyone who's interested in building wealth. The first reason, and I said this before, is three times more profitable than traditional investments like real estate and stock market. Three times more profitable, hey, I'd why not? And then the second reason is that 
you're investing in entrepreneurs is no more risky than other forms of investing as long as you know how to build a diversified portfolio. And I shared the statistics, right? So if you Google it, right? Go to chat GPT. An average return on investment of real estate and the stocks, they typically they look at a 10-year rolling span and it goes up and down a little bit. But on average, they are between 11 and 13% right? They correlate around 11 to 13% of return on investment. And that uh, part of that is because stocks don't jump, they fall, fall hard and fast, but they only go up incrementally. Okay. And real estate has a whole lot of other expenses associated with it so that your actual return on investment is a very small part of the total number of what that, that asset might represent. Right. But the average angel investment portfolio, 30 percent, over 30 percent. Actually, I think it's like 36 percent. It's a fact. Right. And I know I know you're saying, hold up, Karen, hold up, Karen. If it's really three times more profitable, how come I don't hear about it all the time? Like I do. You know, well, want to learn how to invest in Bitcoin? I swear, I think I get a, a message at, at least every other every couple of days from somebody asking if I want to learn how to invest in Bitcoin, right? Or why aren't my friends talking about getting into crowdfunding investing? Like, hey, do you want to crowdfund? My daughter even said on an Instagram thing or whatever, a live stream she was doing one New Year's Eve, she says... uh, Hey, anybody know how to invest in Bitcoin? Hit me up. <laughs> right? Like, uh, you know, I, I, great question. I, I, it's got, it had me scratching my head too. Because when the Jobs Act passing it, making it legal for anyone with cash on hand to invest in entrepreneurs, I was literally afraid that millions of people rushed to start investing in the entrepreneur. I mean, I literally was. I was panicked. That this thing that I felt so much about because I felt like the biggest barrier to entrepreneurs raising capital was this general solicitations restriction. And we had to work around it all the time because my angel investor group, I had 30 or 40 people in a room at a time here, but I had a hundred plus investors out in the U.S. that had signed up virtually to be a part of the angel investor group and had given me all kinds of information about the things they invested in. And so the way we had to engage them that was actually really the reason why I started the podcast to begin with way back then was to be able to do an interview with a entrepreneur that was raising capital without saying they were raising capital, but saying, hey, they were just at our angel investor event. And, you know, we would talk about their business proposition and their and what they were, you know, all the opportunity, the problem they were solving, all the stuff without talking about their raising capital. And then we would create a trackable link, send it out to the entire network of my investors and those that clicked on it. Then we would follow up and say, hey, it looks like you were interested on this. Right. And so that was that was literally a the main reason why we did it and SEO backlinks. Right. That was the main reason why we had we had done it to stay within the rules of this general solicitation, right? And so um, I was just really worried that this, I called it a redheaded stepchild and no off, no offense to redheads <laughs> of an asset class, but, you know, they, that, I, because the biggest mistake that, that investors make when they're first getting started, and I myself had made this same mistake, investing on emotion. Invest me because you love that particular entrepreneur. Investing on emotion without going through the paces of deciding whether this company was really worthy of your investment. And I was I was on a, a board call today with a company that I'm working with, uh, talking to the board of directors about, uh, you know where they are. So the difference between uh like a friends and family and the easier money that it takes for an entrepreneur to raise versus you know going to business angels is that they're typically people that believe in the entrepreneur or believe in what the entrepreneur is trying to do. And they're like, oh, I can't believe somebody hasn't done this before. Got to get, I want to see this, this solution in the marketplace. So they'll throw money in based on emotion. 
business angels don't do that because they've, you know, they, they're, and, and, and in that case, when a company is raising beyond their seed round, they're competing against all the other companies that are raising capital. And did I not say there's a finite amount of capital, 350,000 registered cardholder and angel investors, 350,000 that have invested in reg CF, right? But there's literally probably a million companies raising capital, you know? And so, um, yeah. So anyway, I thought they needed this book. I And I did not want to give any more fodder to the financial advisors out there that have been spreading the fear, uncertainty, and doubt about angel investing to be able to tell their clients that went off and did this, that, you know, they've been saying it's too risky. You can't do it. I told you so. And and by the way, the reason why they they discourage angel investing wasn't because they thought it was too risky. It's because of the rules of the SEC set up that required the only way for them, they have this thing called selling away. And so if they advised a company, a, a client on investing in, an, in a private equity transaction because it's securities, then they couldn't... Um, and it wasn't being run through their broker dealer. They even if they didn't make money on it, they they would fear that they would lose their license because it would be selling away. Whereas real estate is not a security, so they could say, "Oh yeah, take ten percent of your portfolio and invest in real estate." Oh, you should invest in these kind of things, that kind of stuff, you know. Rather than, um, you know, and they might even take a look at it and give them their two cents worth. But it wasn't considered selling away when. You know, but there were but early stage companies that are raising a million dollars is not something that a Merrill Lynch is going to take on. They only take on deals that are raising a hundred million dollars because they have to make it available to all of their investors. You know, when they do a private equity transaction. And so that is just the nature, it was the nature of the beast. And they broker dealers have to charge big fees. They charge 10 grand retainer a month plus 12% of the transaction. No company raising a million dollars could afford that. So there was just this disconnect, which again, ergo why the Jobs Act was necessary. And I think and I think it could be because, you know, everybody talks about Bitcoin. I mentioned that, right? And people go like, why I hear about Bitcoin? Why not? Why don't I, why do I hear about Bitcoin investing and I don't hear about angel investing? Well, it's because it's in the news all the time, good and bad, but it's in the news. Right. And you can track its value and its wild ride. It swings just like you can the stock market. When I was preparing for this, I went and looked, what is the latest price of, of Bitcoin today? And I could look at what was the price for the last year. I could totally see all the ups and downs. You can't do that on angel investing because they're private. Right. So it's something that people can do. They can Google it. They can see it. They can do all that kind of stuff. Right. And you can get involved for just, you know, uh, like uh, if y'all watch Super Bowl, uh, not this last year, but the 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 year before uh, when um, Coinbase did the ad with the QR code bouncing on the screen. This is a Super Bowl ad, right? And I'm up there and I got it, the QR code and they gave me $500 credit, I think, to be able to go and invest in uh in bitcoin in fractions you could you could do it for 500 I, I get like a tiny piece of one bitcoin or i could go find ones that are in the startup stage of a of a cryptocurrency that i might be able to buy for 500 dollars, right you know and then there's these news reports of the teenager that made, made tens of thousands of dollars in just a few weeks right i i when i was looking at this i saw all, he's got a whole thing of a whole series of videos now talking about how he did it right and when you have huge celebrities promoting crypto like larry david or tom brady or even matt damon during nfl games when you have a huge audience of people that really quite frankly like to gamble because they're doing fantasy football they're they're able to do all these things to them then it is it is ripe audience because their level of like oh why not this too oh and matt says it's good 
But just like the guy in that funny TV ad, I, I couldn't find out who it was. I think it's some kind of job, like a jobs ad for like Indeed or something like that. And, you know, one day he's celebrating, oh, he's a crypto millionaire and he's going to like resign his job and he's out at the clubs at night with the big champagne and like that. And then the next day he's back at work broke, right? Because of the fluctuation of the market. When Matt Damon did the crypto.com ad in 2021, Bitcoin was trading at 60000 about $60,000 a piece. A year later, one Bitcoin, so in 2022, it was $20,000, $20,770. A year to, year to date on that. Today, it's $26,485. That's, I just checked it today. In fact, in the past year, it has not gone above 30000 I call that risky. And the thing that I think about Bitcoin that people don't really get, I mean, sophisticated investors, you know, people that that have worked on their financial intelligence, you know, like if you ever looked at any Robert Kiyosaki's kind of stuff, Sharon Lecter, you should watch my podcast with Sharon Lecter. But uh, the cash flow quadrant, EBSI, entrepreneurs, service providers or, or sole proprietors, business owners and investors, right? So this side of the equation are people that um, have to deal with money after taxes. Taxes are taken out, right? And, they, and they're all about time and money. Time is exchanged for money. Whereas over here, business owners are building businesses that operate without them being there because they have systems and stuff like that. So it's like they're making money in, in their sleep. I was listening to this uh, I was talking to a, a friend of mine today, a lawyer that, that I was going to engage, and he has a side business he started that is uh, water bottling. And he has an alkaline water product that he brought out. And he said, you know, last night I sold 10,000 cases in my sleep because it's out in Walmart and stuff like that, right? That's why business owners, you know, make the most money, why business owners are considered the best way to create wealth. But what they don't think about is the I. The I is the investor, putting your money to work, investing in things that make money in your sleep. So when you invest in a business owner that's working their tail off to create wealth for themselves and their family and their generation, you make money too in your sleep, all right? That's that's that piece of it, right? And so when you look at, when you look at crypto, what is it? It's like day trading. It's very volatile because... Although it is in a transaction like public stocks, right? You buy and sell stocks in the public market from another stock owner. In crypto, you're buying and selling from one crypto owner to another. You're the next crypto owner. And, it, and there's a transaction that goes up until there's a sell-off. Same thing with the stock market. When there's a sell-off, the stock markets drop. And sometimes it, it can happen because of very specific reasons like uh, co catastrophes like 9-11. Uh, all your travel and transportation stocks dropped. All your plane things dropped. Everybody got out of that sector. But it's usually the big money markets that are moving hedge funds are moving money out of a sector and stuff like that. And I have a theory that part of the reason why you see a volatility in the stock market, if you would just track it with the um, – sorry, uh, I'm – if for those that are watching, I keep messing with my hair because my my fans, but with my hair on my face, the um, the stock market, um, they you know if you you correlate between a drop in Bitcoin or a drop in the ICO markets and the Ethereum and those kind of stuff, and you would see um, correlation of the big market makers, the big the big market movers moving money out of their stock holdings to offset their losses in crypto to keep their investors whole and the overall performance of their fund strong, right? Just, just sort of my theory, but you know, the thing about it to consider with crypto is that there's no financial performance of a company to consider or the assets own, or anything that might give the market makers reasons to want to buy the stock and drive the price back up, right? When it comes to, to crypto, what drives it back up? It's demand. But, you know, if there's, it, it's, it's like the ultimate Ponzi scheme, okay? And, and 
world economic pressures aside, right? The, the, there, I believe that there's an inner relationship. There's lots of just things that have like caused the stock market to drop in different areas and different sectors. But it's just, you know, I know friends of mine that that they did get in early. So they have made money. And even with that drop of 60, they didn't buy at 60. They bought at 10. So even at 20, they're still making money, but they get up at two or three o'clock in the morning to make a transaction because it's not even a fixed price on the transaction. The actual cost of the transaction varies on demand. So everything about it is variable. That's about the pure definition of risk I can possibly imagine compared to angel investing, right? And don't get me wrong. My disrespect for crypto does not apply to blockchain or even NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Because crypto is an application on blockchain, just like smart contracts, uh, the stuff they're doing in real estate, supply chain management, lots and lots of great things happening on blockchain that fundamentally is shifting and advancing business in ways that we couldn't even imagine before. And NFTs, they at least have something of value attached to it. And, and even if it is art and it's subjective and you may not feel like, oh, why would I do a, uh, why would I want to get a cartoon of a monkey? There's a whole other area that it is, it is tracking where I've seen opportunities where it's, um, they're using NFTs, non-fungible tokens to track assets of like when people buy a limited release of something. And they want to prove that asset of value that it can't be plagiarized or copied. They put an NFT on it. And so it could be very well be an, a tangible something of value that has an NFT, not even a digital market of something. I have a vision that as I build this virtual network of angel investors through this program, I will be offering an NFT as part of a membership in that in the future, I've got it all mapped out on how I'm going to do that. So yeah, I'm, I, I like NFTs and I love blockchain. All right. It's very different than crypto. So back to my story about Jane. So I told her about how you make investments in increments of hundreds or thousands of dollars, or even, a, or and own a small piece of multiple businesses, right? Like this, right? And then those businesses are run by passionate entrepreneurs who are bringing an innovation to market that use your money to grow their business. And eventually they build it to sell the company to a larger company or go public or sell their stock and sell their stock on the open market. And then you get your return on investment. But as I mentioned before, there's all kinds of different ways. The, the, the thing that I had called the angel profitability blueprint is designed to help you build a portfolio of 10 companies so that will produce different types of, of returns on investment. So if you heard that you can create great wealth as an entrepreneur, and then by default, you must know that you can create great wealth as an investor in, in those successful on the, on the, uh, on, in entrepreneurs. It, it's just a fact. It's just logic. Almost every, because the companies that you know of that you buy their products for all that kind of stuff they currently that's what they do they you know there were angel investors in those companies one of the top object, objections about angel investing is that it's too risky because the odds of the business failing well you know what data from the bureau of labor statistics show that 20 percent new businesses failed during the first two years of being open 45% during the first five years and 65% during the first 10 years. And only 25% of new businesses make it to 15 years or more. You know what? In the 20 years that I have been working with entrepreneurs over 20 years, even to my IBM days, ready, getting them ready to attract capital and coach them on how, how to raise their seed round, those stats have not changed. They have pretty much been the same statistics. Yet, millionaires still invest in them. They can invest in anything they want, but they still invest in entrepreneurs. And being an investor in a business is not as risky as being the founder of that business. Yes, you may lose the money, but you don't lose everything else, right? And and that's the re that's and I would venture to say part of the reason why those companies fail 
after that five years, stuff like that, is because of lack of access to capital, the very problem that the Jobs Act was was trying to solve. Access to capital, unlocking the check accounts, the 401ks and the self-directed IRAs of those 7 million potential accredited investors and the 7 million people that invest in real estate and the 150 million people that invest in the stock market because they could all be investing in entrepreneurs if they knew they could and if they knew how. All right. Yep, that's right. So it's the angel profitability blueprint is my, my uh, element of success on this. And I'm actually going to offer it up as a, a, a free download, uh, a, something that's available just for free for those people that sign up for the intro classes, because I think it's important. It's an important takeaway. So um, it's designed to give you a short term returns so that you get money back in a few months you know, within a year, as well as income producing returns, just like rental investment property and long-term big wins like your traditional, you know, IPO or, or if you were investing in real estate for a long haul, or you thought you were investing in a blue chip, chip stock and we're just going to keep it in your portfolio. My dad gave my daughter when she was born or very little, about $10,000, $20,000 worth of stocks in blue chip companies, UPS, Coca-Cola, and Maybe it was just those two. And um, and Delta. Well, Delta got hammered in with 9-11. And uh, UPS, something else. Coca-Cola, something else. Anyway, those the stocks went up and down, but they did not retain their value. That of what he gave them. They were never back. They, it, they, they did not get back to that value. Um, uh, you know, maybe now... 25 years later, they are, and they're more than that because they go and do stuff. But it just, you know, it's really quite amazing that, you know, you think that, but that's it, it, it. The stock market is just as you don't lose your money if you don't sell. So you just hold on to it, but it, it takes a while. And I'll, I'll talk some more about that too. So my friend said she had been planning on investing in real estate, but the market has just risen. The prices have been rising. The mortgage rates are higher than she expected for the investment property. Yeah, they're about two points higher than what they offer real estate. I mean, for, for private, your own personal home. And, you know, there are other benefits to investing in entrepreneurs. It just seems so risky because there isn't anything tangible like a house associated with it. And that's where you, you once you understand the structure, once you understand things, you understand that you can make those decisions and you can see the value. It is in what the company is doing, the product that they're building, their intellectual property that's protecting the that property, that product from competition. Those are the assets, right? It is what they're building. The company itself becomes the asset. And yes, I said it. I get it. This is the same boat a lot of people are in. And here's the thing. One of the reasons why the Job Act was passed, bipartisan in Congress, 2012, was because, if you recall, the financial collapse of the mortgage-backed securities, the real estate bubble, had crashed in 2009-2010 timeframe, wiped out much of the real estate holdings of the investors, plus the perceived equity value of their primary residence. You see... What makes real estate investment risky and expensive is that investors, most of those seven million with the income of seventy five thousand dollars or more, are not buying real estate. They're taking out a loan with a bank, and they are a a short. They are a per. They are a person that could own that, but they own it with the bank until the bank's loan is paid off. And and anybody that owns real estate knows that so you got to make enough money on your your rental to cover that mortgage plus the repairs when the 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 floor is flooded because a pipe busted during the crazy frozen time we had in december or the septic tank is full and now you got to pay three and a half three thirty five hundred dollars to have somebody come in and pump that out those things come out of pocket and if you're only making $500 profit on that particular, because of your mortgage on it, that particular property, well, guess what? You just ate up how many months of income? 
paying for whatever that is. So, you know, you're, it, it, it's just the nature of it. Or if you don't have the insurance that covers it, or it's not something that's covered by insurance, you have to come out of pocket. And so that is what, when your tenant moves out and you got to fix it up, put new pet carpets in there and paint it so you can put it, you can charge more and get another tenant in there. You got three, four months where you're making no income and just spending money. <clears throat> so those are things that don't factor in when they talk about how real estate, but that is, that's factored in when the world of, of return on investment says on average, real estate portfolios produce a 10 or 11% return on investment because it's not just a, a, an asset that's $350,000 that you own outright. You own it with the bank and you had to put 50 grand down in order to buy it, right? Or to fix it up. So if you are sitting on, so what that means to you, if you have tens of thousands of dollars saved up because you were going to buy another piece of rental property or get started investing in real estate, the rising cost of real estate has shut you out of owning that rental property. Investing in entrepreneurs might be a great option for you. That 30000 you saved up for your first or second real estate property, you could invest in 10, 15, 20 crowdfunding and co companies with that. Truly make a diverse portfolio and do other things like what I've been talking about. I even told Jane about how to unlock the capital in her 401k so that she could direct her 401k through a self-directed IRA or Roth IRA to invest in entrepreneurs instead of those low yield mutual funds or the volatile stock market that you might have when you, you know, say, oh, I'm going to put 50% in the stock market and 50% in this, you know, mutual fund, right? Speaking of the stock market, my other friend, the other one I'm telling you about now, my friend, Bob. He's a well-paid employee with a substantial stock market portfolio. Very proud of his stock market. In fact, it drives a whole lot of his decisions on everything else in his life is what will make my stock portfolio go up. Uh, it's how he votes, right? I actually, and he actually had purchased my book when I it first came out and read it and even shared it with many of his friends. Yeah, when we were together recently, he said, he asked me, why invest in private companies versus public companies? I had to like keep my poker face on because I was just stunned that he was out. He had read my book. And here he was asking that question. And I share with him the fundamental difference. When you buy a public stock, again, you're buying it from another stock investor, not the company. It is a transaction between two people or an institution that's selling him, like a hedge fund that's selling that stock. The only benefit to the company when their stock goes up is that they can leverage that for acquisition or debt financing, right? They can leverage that. And it's, it's, it's you know, shareholder value is, is a big deal when it comes to their financial strength of their, por of their portfolio of what they have, right? And so... Um, but the biggest challenge startups, small business owners have in getting the capital they need to start and grow their business before cash flow and profits sufficient to fool the growth on their own. Angel investors, crowdfunding investors, community investors, that's kind of a new thing that's happening, investing in the companies in your community. Invest, invest in that sweet spot, spot between an idea and bankable. Or if this in, in the programs that are expanding business, I kind of talked about that, like you're investing your 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 fellow friend's business, right? Like through the interest rate exemption or reg A plus, it is the capital a company needs that exceeds what they can get from a bank. That money comes from those private investment funds and the jobs will be created. The products will be invented to solve a problem in the marketplace and it expands the, con the economy because of the ripple effect it has. For those investors that grow into what I call business angels, people in the business of investing and in entrepreneurs as a regular part of their life, it's like a hobby that they, they work on getting better and better at with each investment decision. Right. It's something that they become interested in. They want to learn about it. They want to do it. So like if you want to learn how to become a skier, you don't just jump out and start skiing. You take a training course, you practice, and then you go down the, the big, big, you know, black diamonds. Right. You don't just do that to start with. Just because you can doesn't mean you should without the proper training. That's why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing right now. Right. 
So they do it because they also do it. Angel investors also do it because of these feelings of contribution. The impact their, their their money has when their money goes into a company that's solving a problem that they're, they're they care about that they're passionate about. It could be something that, that that's in their own life. It could be a problem that they wish they had a solution for. It could be, you know, I see it all the time. You know, and if I when I was running my angel group, we would have um, companies that the people would say, "Oh, I'm a soft software investor," but then somebody would come in and. They would have, there was this company that uh, they would have a solution where it was a, a a pill dispenser that could be connected through internet or things for home health. And you would know whether your mom was taking her medications, even though you weren't there. And the nurse could check in on her, you know, through a telecall, you know, to be able to check on her. And because their mom was, you know, in that situation, they would be like, I want to invest in that. Right. So that was the emotion. They were passionate about a problem that was being solved that they hadn't really thought about. And, and that's that compassionate capitalist part of it. Right. And so. Um, and they get this this sense of satisfaction watching these companies grow, watching their money being put to work for a company to get to a whole nother stage of business. It actually angel investing investing actually satisfies the six fundamental human hierarchy of needs, right? I did a whole series of, of in uh, videos on what that is and why those is. And they're, they're part of the, the, they're now part of the maximizing system. And you could still go to YouTube and find them. If you go find this on YouTube, you go to the compassionate capitalist channel, they're listed there. So, but you don't get those feelings in the stock market. You're just buying and selling. It's a transaction. I mean, you get, you get feelings of, Oh, my money's going up. And your money's increasing in value, but there's no other sense of of reward and fulfillment in that. And you don't get that when you're buying real estate for a rental company. Maybe in a flip because you saw, you know, this ugly house turn beautiful, right? And that's a sense of like, oh, it's done. But it's really more like it's done. It's like a, it's a, thank God it's done, and now I can make money on it. It's not because you're watching something grow. Right. And it's not that you're solving a problem that affects millions of people or changes the world because a whole new market has been created. Many people think of investing in entrepreneurs is too risky. But it, again, it's no more risky than real estate or the stock market when you know how to build a diversified portfolio. I mentioned about the real estate crash and this at the same time, the stock market crashed and tumbled. It took 10 years for those values of where they were just to get back to the spot they were when it crashed. 10 years, really 10 years. When you looked at the the, the market in general, now obviously there's exceptions in, in certain markets here, but it, and by and large, it was. It, it took them 10 years. And, and so technically you don't lose your money if you don't sell, but this idea that angel investing is illiquid because you might have to hold it for 10 years. Well, I just showed you there. That, you know, you if you lose the value in your stock market and your real estate, if you're able to continue to make the payments on that real estate, you will have to hold it 10 years to get it back. At least that's what it took. OK, now we have a, a surge, another bubble that we're in the middle of because of, of a whole nother reason why I talk about that. But the key difference in both those cases is that the factors for the real estate and the stock market collapse were outside of your control. The value is set by the buying and selling like crypto. It takes time and demand, demand to regain that value. Where with startups and growth stage companies, the money that you, along with hundreds of others, maybe thousands of other investors, are going directly into growing the value of that company. Bringing out products, new products that will grow the revenue, increase the value of the company, and that's not. Not because of a transaction, but because they're building something of value. It's the company. Remember, investing in entrepreneurs has a long history of success among the wealthiest investors in the world, including the DuPonts, Rockefellers. Nearly every company that is public now or a household name had angel investors in it at some point. Home Depot, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Dell. The Jobs Act not only intended to open access to capital for entrepreneurs, but also for those investors that had lost that retirement and their real estate in the stock crash. They lost their real estate. The industry lobbied Congress to change the laws, and they did because they saw the rewards 
the results of reward-based crowdfunding. Think about it. You didn't know that. You don't know this. I talk about it in the book. If you haven't read my book, if you haven't heard me talk about this, because you're not a, a follower of me on stuff, but 3D printing, smartwatches, drones, VR headsets, even fidget widgets. I'm holding one for those that are watching, right? Even fidget widgets all came to market because of reward-based crowdfunding. That was what was around for 20 years before we had equity-based crowdfunding, literally 20 years, okay? That's how a lot of films, music got done, reward-based, right? I got uh, early access to something. I get a reward. I get something in exchange for my money, right? So they pre-purchased these products, even before, in some cases, they hadn't even been made. They were, they, they, you didn't even know for certain. They had a prototype. They knew it worked, but they hadn't made any kind of, of a lot of them, right? And so they would put hundreds or even thousands of dollars into these companies. And these companies raised millions of dollars in reward-based crowdfunding. And then they went on to raise VC money and sell their company or like Oculus headset, right? They got first got a, a hundred million or something from VCs and, and Facebook, and then Facebook bought them for billions of dollars. You know, the reward, the people that had bought those original versions of those Oculus headsets made nothing on that. They gave them the seed capital, you know, hoping to get a product, right? And those companies got launched, but they made no money on that. And, you know, and it wouldn't it wouldn't be like you you would have made 50 grand on a thousand dollar investment, but you might have made 5K. Right. You at least would have had something different. You might have had the product and equity. That's the way a lot of them are doing it now. So Congress said, why not let the middle class get to invest like the ultra high net worth people and start to bridge this wealth gap? <clears throat> this is particularly keen for women and people of color that have not have long, 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 long time not had a seat at the table. Pull up a chair, I say. Pull up a chair and get and start learning about how to invest in this asset class. And when that company goes public, <coughs> excuse me. Even even in the dot com bomb, right? Or so when you real retail investors jump in, into the market, on, jump on a stock. We saw this with Facebook. We saw it big time with uh, Snapchat. And so say the the strike price is at fifteen dollars a share, and it rises to twenty dollars. You know, and it's going up and up and up, and then all of a sudden it starts to fall, and it goes down to ten dollars or something in a matter of weeks after the initial IPO. The people that invested when that company was starting up and growing. Those people that put that money at risk, but saw the future potential of what that company was going to do and, and the impact it was going to have and the revenue it was going to generate. And then they, they, they put that money in and they might have started out at 50 cents share or a dollar share. Okay. When, when that company IPO'd at $15 and then they sold their stock at $20, they made 20 times their investment. But those people that got in at $15 a share and thought, oh, yeah, yeah, it's going to go. And then just a couple of weeks later, it drops to 10. They've already lost $5 a share. All right. Everybody, like, so by the time you hear about it, to buy it in the stock market, it's too late to make money on it. I mean, you can, you will make money on it. But still. There's a way for angel investors, some of these angel investors, there's organizations that you can buy stock in a company like uh, 23 and Me, uh, Airbnb, uh, all these companies that are getting ready to go public. You can go and buy stock in those companies. Now, you have to be accredited to do it, but you can buy stock in those companies and you won't get them because you're buying them from employees that have, that have the stock right now. You know, you're not going to get it at a dollar a share. If their strike price is going to be $15 a share, you might get it for $8 a share or $10 a share, but you'll still be able to sell it when it first goes public and you got it and you still have a basis point that's a lot lower than, you know, what uh, people that buy it after it goes public. And not every company is going to do that, right? But it, but it is why you have a strategy for diversifying based on state, industry, and type of offering that I call 
the Angel Profitability Blueprint. I offer it in this Wealth Maximizer system. All right. So I want to encourage you. I uh, thank you for listening for as long as I've been talking. I was going to get into furthermore into uh, risks. Uh, I guess you'll just have to sign up to learn more about how I overcome risk or or please to go and follow me on uh, at uh, uh, go follow me on Facebook and on LinkedIn and stuff like that, because I do put out videos on these topics. But go to do the deal dot org, do the deal dot org. And you can sign up for a free intro class. You'll get in, you'll get a free book called the uh, the 12 Secrets of Innovation and Wealth um, that will be uh, given to you as well as part of that. And uh, you'll get, you'll start to get my video tips that I talk a lot about this stuff. And, uh, you know, you'll get, you'll learn, you'll do the first step that says, is this something that you want to invest more time in learning? And do you want to invest money into like getting into a, a more in-depth training? Uh, you know, you'll learn how to make investments in increments of hundreds or thousands of dollars. You'll learn how to use the angel profitability blueprint to find deals, evaluate them and build a profitable portfolio of at least 10 investments. You'll get started on the path to learn the inside secrets to angel investing. And you'll be able to invest in businesses where passionate entrepreneurs are bringing innovation to the market and you share their passion. And you have the feeling of impact and contribution. And just, uh, I, I see it when I've had, when some of my angel investors and some of the things, they'd walk in the room and they'd have a pep in their step because, you know, I I, could, I, I decided for those 45 year olds that were becoming my angel investors at the time, it was like better than a midlife crisis. You know what I mean? They could go spend a hundred grand on a fancy new car sports car or they could invest in entrepreneurs and they got a greater sense of joy you didn't need to go have a, an affair to bring it you know spice back into your life go invest in something you're passionate about a problem you're solving somebody so there's somebody out there trying to solve a problem that you think needs to be solved i promise you there is okay so again do the deal.org learn if this is the right kind of a thing for you uh, don't and uh, you know join uh, this growing community of compassionate capitalists. And with that, I'll say onwards and upwards. Thank you so very much for tuning in and listening. And uh, please share this very much. If there's ever a podcast to share or a video to share, this would be it. So Karen Rand signing off. Onwards and upwards. Have a great day. <music>